the great un. So you may know that in Zen Buddhism, they um, one strand of Zen in particular, Rinzai Zen, really draws on what are called koans. These kind of mind-stopping statements or teachings, uh, riddles, uh, seeming contradictions that you know open us into, can break us open into deeper realms of reality and consciousness. And our occasional guest teacher, Henry Shuckman, who's an abbot of uh, Mountain Cloud Center in New Mexico, uh, really explores this territory of koans, among other things, in his fantastic book, could not recommend it more highly, One Blade of Grass. And Henry himself is really drawn on koan practice. Well, you may know that one of the famous um, koans, and I'm not formally trained in Zen, so I apologize to those who are, has to do with a question that came to, I think it might have been Joshu, a, a living person, a, a no longer alive, a real person, who was asked, does a dog have Buddha nature? And Joshu's answer was, mu, M-U. Now, what in the world is meant by that? Literally, the word mu means not or negation. And in the Zen tradition, and in some ways understood more broadly, everything has Buddha nature deep down. A light bulb, a brick, a flower, a cloud, the Milky Way galaxy, your thoughts, my thoughts, all of it, your being, my being. The nature of all is Buddha nature. What do we mean by that? Setting that important question aside for the moment, of course a dog has Buddha nature. And yet Joshu, deeply realized being, said, Mu, not. Now what was the not to? Hmm. Was the not to the kind of gotcha question that came at him? Was the mu, the not, to the limitations of conceptualizing in general, languaging things, trying to catch reality in our tattered nets of language? Mu. And also, are there implications here that go way beyond even um, what I've said so far? Now, Henry Schuckman would by now have been doing a much better job than I'm doing with all this. But recently, I was meditating and reflecting on a practice that I'm engaging a lot and I'll often talk about or include in the meditation guidance that I offer of exploring very experientially in a very embodied, somatic, somatically rich and emotionally rich kind of way in this moment, in this present, can we relax as much as possible, even sometimes completely, any contraction or craving in the present? Complete release. And in that release is a sense of basic all rightness in the present, often with emotionally positive qualities of contentment and warm heartedness and peacefulness. To support myself in that meditative practice, it just kind of arose, the um, word um, uncompelled. That's an odd kind of word, uncompelled, but it's a feeling of letting go of any sense of compulsion or drivenness or contracted possessiveness or grasping after or solidifying what is insubstantial and transient and foam-like that is passing through us as the streaming of consciousness, uncompelled. And some other words began to come to me. Uncontracted, undriven, unbound. <laughs> un this and un that. And I just started laughing and laughing and laughing as my kind of maybe mu light, the great un, Great un, unbound, uncontracted, uncontrived, unfabricated. These are technical terms in Buddhism, unfabricated, unconstructed, unconstructed. 
beautiful, beautiful. I just started laughing and laughing, and I'm still pretty rested in that sense. So you too, who knows, might like to work with the great Un, uh, you know, allowing some of the mysteries uh, of this inquiry to fill your heart and free your mind. Uh, so anyway, that's that's something of the great un. So you might inquire for yourself in the present. What's it like to feel unafraid, unthreatened, uncontracted, unbound? What's that like? What's that like? Now, if you like, you can use the more affirmative construction of the phrase. Uh, someone once asked me if putting a negation in front of a word somehow is not effective with the brain. And there's a bit of a folklore that if we put a negation in front of something like unafraid, that actually reinforces the sense of being afraid. And, you know, if that's kind of how it lands for you, looking for the more positive uh, statement of that, such as at peace, confident, uh, you know, determined, uh, you know, that might, you know, courageous, that might work better for you. But on the whole, the brain's pretty smart. Uh, it <clears throat> brings stuff together, bingo, and takes them as a single unit. And in fact, in the language of early Buddhism, uh, the Buddha often taught typically in the form of negation, uh, not self, not harming, not fabricated, not conditioned, uh, not killing, not stealing, not lying, not intoxicating, not exploiting or harming others or oneself sexually. Uh, and it's okay. It's okay. If it works for you, uh, it depends on your own mind, but if it works for you, it's really okay to use the negation formulation. So the great un, the great un. So you might inquire, what's that like in the present to kind of rest in the great un? including some of the kind of mystery or whimsicalness of uh, the way I'm talking about it here. So the bottom line, especially as I finish here, is um, to find ways into what calls your heart and rest there. Rest in two senses as stabilize there and take refuge there. Uh, allow yourself to come to ease and, and refuel and repair and recover from the hurly-burly of the daily round. So what calls your heart, including what you might become aware of is the absence of various things or the lessening, the easing, the relief, the release of certain things. And what remains? It's a lot of the value of looking at things in the form of negation. What remains when you, in the moment, are uncompelled, uncontracted, undriven, unbound, unfabricated, unconditioned? What remains? That's a really good, very experiential, very powerful inquiry that anyone can do at any point at any level. And it's very hopeful because the suggestion here is that what remains when we release the knotted contractions of selfing, when we release craving, when we release divisiveness, when we release ill will, when we let these go, what remains? A natural, inherent, peacefulness and wakefulness and lovingness and happiness. That's what remains. It's really beautiful, isn't it? So a lot of what life's about and a lot of what practice is about is uncontracting. It's opening up, opening out, letting go, and trusting what you fall back into when you release. Okay, so I'm going to be scanning the... Um, chat sidebar along the way if you have questions or comments. Um, also, I hope to open it up for definitely uh, some questions or comments related to this topic, 
which uh, is very, very practical in the real world of relationships. You know, how do we combine the best of loving kindness, compassion, commitment to justice for others and so forth? How can we do that while standing our own ground and not being taken advantage of, not being overwhelmed, not having our boundaries overrun, you know, having our own legitimate needs uh, met as well. You know, how do we bring those both together, right? It's a real, real art. So I want to dive into this through the lens initially of what's called attachment theory. It's a topic you're probably quite familiar with. Certainly many people are. It's this basic body of knowledge in psychology with some related uh, methods that uh, studies and takes into account the models of relationship, the paradigms of relationship we social primates, mammals, acquire initially in early childhood and then can be reinforced or unlearned to some extent over the course of um, the rest of our lives. So in attachment theory, there's this notion that relationships don't have to be perfect, and yet still an individual in a relationship can feel securely attached to the other person, depending on the nature of the relationship, including a child with a parent. So even though there might be some rough and tumble occasionally and some conflict and issues to work out, fundamentally, you know, a person can feel secure, not afraid of what's going to happen next, um, calm, not anxious, like they're on solid ground. On the other hand, research shows probably eh, ballpark, at least half or so of the population, uh, depending on the combination of their own temperament and their history uh, in childhood, including their history with primary caregivers like their parents, you know, ish, depending on how you assess it, roughly half the population, including me as a kid, becomes insecurely attached, uneasy, unsettled, not secure, insecure. That's a kind of an un, that's problematic, unsecure. Uh, in relationships with primary caregivers, which then often gets transferred, these models of relationship, these ways of being in relationship, these ways of relating, these modes of relating, get transferred to other people friends, and then growing up, partners, and sometimes there's a kind of generational transmission in which these patterns of relating, of being insecurely attached, can be handed down from generation to generation to generation. There are three major patterns, uh, two in particular, of insecure attachment. One is through different terms. Essentially, we could call it anxious or ambivalent uh, insecure. This is someone who, especially in early childhood, kind of moves back and forth between clinging and reproach. Clinging, reproach. You know, come here, bad mommy. <laughs> come here, bad mommy. Right? You kind of you feel pulled in two different directions. A second kind of attachment is often called avoidant in which there's a sense that one can be in relationship as long as one doesn't ask for much from other people and one has a kind of optimal distance from others, avoidant. Uh, then there's a third type that's pretty rare, has to do typically with very, very traumatic, disruptive, chaotic, early childhood experiences. This called disorganized. That's kind of a muddle of multiple different kinds of uh, attachment patterning. Now, certainly uh, as adults, uh, a person could experience combinations of avoidance and ambivalent anxiety, you know, sometimes with features of distancing or clinging or reproach, you know, kind of mixed together. But often there's a kind of a primary pattern that develops in someone which then becomes a way of having relationships, especially significant, consequential, vulnerable, important relationships with other people. Okay, so this all might be fairly familiar to you. I wanna focus now on avoidant relating, avoiding, avoidant attaching, 
with a metaphor that I learned from the work of James Masterson. So I want to give proper credit there, uh, as I was taught it by this wonderful teacher I had, Carla Clark, giving Carla uh, full credit here, uh, who's a wonderful PhD um, teacher of therapists uh, in Marin County, where I live. So in the metaphor here of avoidant attachment, and you could see how much this kind of fits for you, we orbit the other person. We don't land on the planet with full intimacy. Huh? Because that would feel scary. We're insecure. We don't trust it. Bone deep. You know, uh, it might go really badly. It did go really badly when we were young. Maybe you were someone who, in my own history, uh, when you got really close to a parent, and lowered your guard and really revealed some of what was going on inside, including vulnerable needs or reactions, oof, it would often get used against you in some ways or turned against you as a basis for some kind of criticism or some kind of control. It's a little bit like the Trojan horse metaphor that you see this beautiful horse on the other side of the gates and you go, oh, it's a gift from the departing army. They've given up and they... They want to make peace. They've left us with this beautiful present, this enormous wooden horse outside the gates of Troy. So you open your gates and you, you party, you have a good time. Yay, the war's over. And meanwhile, these armed soldiers have been hiding in the inside this wooden horse. In the middle of the night, they open it up in the belly and they come out and they kill the guards at the gates. They open the gates wide and then the army from Greece uh, returns and sacks Troy. Uh, destroys the city. So, you know, there's some feeling that, uh oh, if I'm, you know, uh, sucked in by this gift mm, and I lower my guard, I'm going to get really wounded and hurt. So, all this can be a reason why we don't land on the other person into the depths of intimacy. Maybe this rings some bells for you. And instead of landing, we swerve away. We preserve an optimal distance. Maybe we pick up a quarrel. Or maybe we um, become intellectual, or we start spacing out a little bit, or we change the subject, or whatever it might be, you know, we swerve away from really landing in full intimacy. Maybe we get provocative in some ways, uh, of one kind or another. You know, the bottom line though is what's the result? What's the functional result of that behavior? If the functional result is a distancing, well, there's probably a motivated purpose, even unconsciously, behind that particular behavior, okay? On the other side, with the metaphor of orbiting, we never break free into full individuation, full autonomous expression of our whole self. Uh, we're always orbiting. Whew. We don't become our own, we don't become our own planet, our own, you know, spaceship. And uh, because it feels uncomfortable, to be fully self-expressed or be fully independent, including in ways that uh, aren't um, wanted maybe by a caregiver. Maybe we're punished. Uh, my own experience, again, speaking of myself, avoidantly attached, is that in the times when I did express myself, how I, like, I really felt, uh, whether it was with peers or with my parents, very often kaboom, there was a shaming attack or I saw shaming attacks of one kind or another land on other people who really lived themselves, that lived to their own truth out loud in a really committed, kind of noble, here I am, this is who I am kind of way. Kaboom, of one kind or another. Pew. I sure didn't want that to happen. Maybe you relate to that too. So then the person finds ways to muzzle themselves, to water down their truth rather than fully individuating, fully separating, fully uh, becoming their own person. Um, they water it down. They postpone writing that letter or saying that thing that's in their heart, looking for another occasion, a better day. Uh, one reason or another, you know, they avoid that full establishment of their own independent autonomous being. And so then we tend to oscillate between these two kind of move toward till it gets kind of uncomfortable. Then we move away till that gets uncomfortable. 
and then we oscillate kind of back and forth between these two. So you might think about this in your relationships, including in very subtle ways over the course even of a single interaction, and you might even observe this in other people. Uh, just because, by the way, you are another person um, is you know, kind of uh, trying to maintain an optimal distance in ways that are not necessary. So there's a place for optimal distance that's necessary. Let's say you're with somebody and you know they're really problematic. You keep them at arm's length. There's a good reason for it. Or you've learned over time that if you do kind of let it get one step more real or vulnerable or engaged, trouble begins, especially if they've been drinking. So whatever. Okay, there's a place for that. But if you know intuitively that you're limiting your intimacy at one end of the spectrum, and you know intuitively that you're limiting your full individuation and confident self-expression, appropriate confident self-expression at the other end of the spectrum. If you know that's kind of true for you, you can watch yourself doing it. That can be happening even without the full insecure attachment classification. You might be securely attached fundamentally with another person, yet still have this style that is somewhat problematic, you can see now, or somewhat limiting, or it yeah, it, it limits the fullness of intimacy on the one end and the fullness of being your own person confidently and happily at the other end of the spectrum. So it's worth paying attention to. So how do we do it? How do we help ourselves both have the confidence in me to fully join with another person when that is appropriate? fully land in wholehearted intimacy. How do we help ourselves have the confidence to do that, especially if we have some history of trouble there? And also, how do we develop the confidence, the faith in ourselves to whew, walk to the beat of our own drummer and to our own selves be true? How do we do that? So I want to talk a bit about that, drawing on some teachings of the Buddha and some practical wisdom from, oh, 100 years or so of clinical psychology in the Western tradition. So it really helps first to have a grounded sense that's embodied, that's felt in the body of your basic all rightness in the present. If we don't feel basically all right in the present, then of course, we wouldn't want to take on the challenge of coming closer to another person or breaking away into full independence. You know, we're, we're unsettled. No. If you can, come into a full sense of stability and groundedness in your own body, in your own breathing, in the ongoing livingness of the body in the present. That will help to reduce anxiety, it will also shore up, including based on the what's called interoception, the internal sense of your own embodiment, it will shore up your own sense of being an individual, being here, being established yourself by tuning into the ongoingness of your own body sensations. That's a wonderfully powerful method, you know? They could be doing whatever they're doing. And over here, you are rested in an embodied sense of grounding and centering. Now, many people teach different techniques for doing that. Whatever you find is fantastic. I find it's really helpful to tune into breathing and recognize the truth when it's true. It usually is, not always, that you know, I'm basically all right right now, in the now, in the present, in the eternal present, basically all right, right now. Um, other methods are taught, sensory awareness, deliberate relaxation, tensing muscles and relaxing them, you know, raising the chi, lowering the chi, whatever, whatever works for you. But the fundamental point is establishing that sense of embodied me, I embodied all right me. Really powerful, really, really powerful. Second thing, 
that's really useful um, on both ends of the spectrum, both ends of full joining and full independence, is to really, really keep in mind that the other person has their own unfolding that's distinct from your own. To use the common metaphor of the waves in the ocean, you're a wave, they're a wave. Yes, both of you are water. Great, got that. <laughs> Thank you. And they're their own wave. They have their own history. They have their own thoughts. They have their own body. Uh, they're differentiated from you. And paradoxically, by recognizing how they're over there and you're over here, that can actually make you more comfortable um, hopping over to their side of the fence and being with them in a very open kind of way. Because then you don't still feel so bound to them when you recognize how they're inherently differentiated. You don't feel so implicated by what they think. You can step back from it. You know, like, oh, it's the movie over there of them. <laughs> just like you have your own movie, they have their movie. <laughs> and just like, if your mind is like my mind, you can notice a fair amount of weird stuff in there. It's like a freaking carnival sometimes. Like. Whoa, where'd that elephant come from? <laughs> and that scary clown. And those people, they're so angry with each other. And look, that sweet little child, boom, 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 coming along on their pogo stick. What? Right? Well, guess what? Their mind is like your mind because, you know, their brain is like your brain <laughs> and my brain, for better or worse. <laughs> That's both hopeful and really cautionary, isn't it? In any case, you kind of can realize, you know, they have their own troubles. They have their own burdens. Everybody has a secret struggle. Uh, they have a secret struggle, not entirely known to you. Some of it's pulling them left and right, zigging and zagging. It's not always about you. It's not always about me. It's their journey. So that sense of differentiation and not being fully implicated, not being responsible. You're responsible, as I talked about last week, or maybe the week before, I think, um, uh, for taking care of your own side of the street. The Buddha made an enormous emphasis on um, developing the wholesome, releasing what's problematic, doing our own work, cleaning up our own messes, regulating ourselves, cultivating wisdom over here, doing our own job, you know, carrying our share of the load, doing our own dishes. Uh, you know, he really emphasized that. And so that's our job, just like it's their job to do their dishes or to clean up their side of the street. If you know you're taking care of your side of the street, it really helps to differentiate from them. And in that differentiation, you can look at them with compassion without feeling necessarily implicated or responsible. And that, especially if you belong to a group of people, such as commonly girls and women who've been socialized from early on to take excessive responsibility for relationships and the feelings of others and the inner life of other people, excessive in the sense of um, to harm themselves sometimes, uh, it can be really, really freeing to feel unimplicated. There we have the great un again, unimplicated, unburdened by. Um, some of the issues of other people while well, remaining compassionate toward them. So that's the second big suggestion, differentiation, really emphasizing that. That differentiation also supports the freedom of launching on your own, Whew. unilaterally, not referentially to them. You don't need their permission to push the launch button. You don't need them to fuel your rocket, you can go on your own. And one of the things that really supports that here too, think about a difficult, complicated relationship. How can you give your per self permission to see what you see without their consent or agreement, independent of agreement, independent of their consent to see what you see? How can you give yourself permission and support to value what you value, to have your own priorities. They may not be their priorities. It might be somewhere on their list, but definitely not number one. What's number one for you? 
They have their rights to their priorities. Similarly, you have your rights to your own. Can you claim that for yourself? Can you recognize that in this life, which is fleeting, no one else but you can write your own song or speak from your heart in ways that matter to you. No one else can do that, right? No one else but you can leave your mark in ways seen and unseen, known and unknown, rippling out vastly on this, in this life, on this world. No one but you can do that. What are you waiting for? Their permission? Do you need the applause of the internalized audience to feel that it's okay to walk to the center stage and give your own TED Talk as best you possibly can? You know, we don't need permission to, from the external and especially not from the internal audience to follow our own path with heart. Yes, not deluded, not arrogant, not at the expense of others. Check, 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 check. That's fairly straightforward, actually. What remains is to, is to look deep down. Are there forms of independent action? Are there forms of confident self-expression? Are there forms of really being true to yourself that you've held back from? I think of the metaphor from um, Gulliver's Travels in which Gulliver ends up in the land of the lily putt. These tiny, tiny humans, very, very small, who, as he falls asleep, I think after a shipwreck or something or other, they sneak up on him and tie him to the ground with, you know, a, a thousand threads. And there's Gulliver bound by the threads, but all he really has to do is just stand up, break the threads, and then, you know, stride forth uh, following his own path. You know, what are the threads somehow, maybe, that holds you back from really individuating and expressing yourself fully? And look to those threads that have to do with seeking unnecessary agreement or affirmation or permission from the external audience of others or the internal audience, you know, that you have inside yourself. So two things so far, grounding in the body, incredibly helpful. When you start to feel a wobbly, come back to the body. Also differentiation may start kind of conceptually. You can also do it visually. I do it. I really help myself think you're over there. I'm over here. <laughs> you have your body. I have my body. You know, when I tap myself here, you don't feel it in your chest, right? Your body, my body. And then even little things like imagining a, a glass wall between you or a line on the ground or a picket fence or even, you know, walls very, very thick between you and that other person that gives you the sense that you can be you. It's your life. It's all right um, to, to fully engage it. That really, really helps. Then the last thing I'll just offer here that I'm going to open it up, and I'm really happy to talk about particular situations that relate to, to all of this. Um, it's to feel deep down inside frankly, your own natural goodness. Uh, I was talking about Buddha nature uh, before the formal beginning here, and I was riffing on the well-known Zen koan, Mu, um, and my kind of somewhat lighthearted version of it, the great un, the great not, the great un, uh, unbound, uncontrived, unfabricated, undriven, unafraid. Um, and in all that, uh, what happens when there's a falling away over time, you know, the veils clear away, you're less complicated, you're more and more present, your, your mind is getting quieter and quieter. Uh, you start having more and more of a sense of what was always already true inside you, your own natural goodness, your own inherently good intentions, may be expressed in bad ways sometimes. I've had bad expression of good intentions, certainly myself. Um, may happen again, I hope not, but it might. Uh, you know, your own natural wakefulness, your, your own clear seeing, you know, your own insight, your own um, beauty, 
your own groundedness inherently in the ground of all, including potentially your inherent grounding in the ground of the ground of all with its great mysteries of vastness, timelessness, perhaps consciousness and benevolence. So that's you. That's you. Not getting all arrogant about it, not getting Hallmark Cardi either, not getting sentimental or treacly, just a kind of a, like a basic trust in your own inherent goodness. That basic trust really does support the willingness to step in to the depths of intimacy, to move into the deep end of the pool of closeness with other people because you, you feel like you can kind of really trust yourself. You have a good heart. You don't need to be a saint to have a good heart. Flip the other way, that felt sense, that kind of growing faith in and conviction about your own good heart also helps whoosh you to launch more and more independently and freely because you kind of trust what you'll come up with. You figure, yeah, I'll make mistakes. I'll, I'll write stupid paragraphs, speaking personally, and then I'll maybe clean them up later, hopefully. Maybe somebody will point out something really, oh my goodness, and then I clean it up later. You know, you have a learning curve. Part of trusting yourself is you have a growth curve. You learn, you develop, you heal, you cultivate, you awaken. Can you trust yourself in that way? So I'll open it up now in a moment to responding to some of what's coming in, um, coming into the chat. And also um, I'll hopefully open it up to one or more people to talk with me individually. Uh, so just a quick review. What helps to support me? Opening into we, uh, grounding in the ongoing all rightness of your own body. Second, a feeling and a conceptual clarity about differentiation and an underlying trust in and faith in your own inherent goodness. Okay, and as you go home for the holidays or come back from the holidays or something like that, um, these might be really good, useful things. To pay attention to. Okay, so <clears throat> now I'm going to start responding to questions, uh, and I'll kind of be kind of quick about it, and then maybe talk a little and more at length with one or two people live. So uh, at 7:15, uh, Joan um, made a comment, and I'll use your name if everybody else can see your name anyway in the chat. Uh, great question. Why would we seek intimacy with people who have repeatedly lashed out to our truth? Uh, we wouldn't. We shouldn't particularly if you don't want to. Um, that's why I said in the very beginning, there's certain people that it's appropriate to keep at arm's length. And you decide what's appropriate. Uh, there's certain people that I know from experience that a conversation or a conversation about a particular topic has very little chance <laughs> of being fruitful in any way. There's very little cheese, if any, down that tunnel. So don't go down that tunnel. No, there's no should about it. There's no have to. If you want to, if you want to have a greater depth, even in fairly casual friendships, okay, what well, would help to do that? And what's getting in the way, if anything? And especially um, with those people, it's usually not more than a handful of people who are deeply important to us, are there any limitations so far on the depth of intimacy you're experiencing with them that you'd like to move past? Only if that's true. Only if that's true. Okay. So let's see here. Seeing if there are any questions coming in. I've seen some very useful comments coming in. You can check it out. Uh, let's see. Maynard Bressman at 7.12 uh, Pacific time, 12 minutes past the hour probably where you are, uh, quotes John Kabat-Zinn. Wonderful quote. I, I'm reminded of this. Great. Thank you, Maynard, for bringing it up. You can't control the waves, including the waves from other people and also the internal waves, but you can learn to surf. Excellent. Um, let's see. Great. Uh, some people are, are sending messages to me individually that I just am not going to be able to respond to here. You can also reach out to my website uh, and send me messages there. Please just uh, just know that I'm tossing some balls in the air, so I might be a little brisk in my reply, but I always reply to people. Um, great. 
Okay, I think it's pretty clear. Any particular question about uh, maybe a natural such suction? Okay, someone asked me an extremely important question, 17 minutes past, um, uh, privately to me. How can you feel that you have natural goodness when you have hurt others badly, even physically? Huge, huge question. It's a great question. So, I certainly have not acted out of natural goodness, definitely, okay, for sure. And there are, of course, degrees to this. So first, two things can both be true. We can have a natural goodness that is covered over in the moment, or we are, in effect, hijacked away from it by some part of ourselves just grabbing us and sweeping us away. For me, where it's gotten most problematic has been around anger. Uh, anger neurologically is associated um, with a sense of activation and arousal, which can feel rewarding, and also uh, the activation of neurochemicals, including dopamine and norepinephrine, which can make it feel good, at least in the moment. And then also we can get caught up in our own righteous case that feels so justified about the other person. Totally true. Swept away. But that doesn't mean that our natural goodness wasn't there. Um, it just doesn't mean. It just means that we forgot it. We lost touch with it. We were driven from our natural home. We experienced a, a inner homelessness. Now, acting out of that inner homelessness, we can do some terrible things that have karmas, have consequences in this life, whatever other lives may be. But certainly in this life, there can be consequences, um, including issues we have to deal with, with with other people, other people who just will never forgive or trust us, and that's going to constrain the relationship. All that can be true while inherently, universally, you are not left out of the universal truth of your own inherent underlying Buddha nature, your own inherent underlying natural goodness. And um, so that, now how to practice with it. I see a suggestion coming in about um, self-compassion, wonderfully true. It's kind of helpful and healing to bring compassion to ourselves. Uh, Chris Germer's work on that, uh, Chris, Kristen Neff's on that, who did the first research on self-compassion, wonderful teachers, both of them. We can bring compassion to ourselves. I think it's also helpful to take the um, upper limit, the upper bound, uh, maximum reasonable, you decide what's reasonable, personal responsibility for what you did, own it. Interestingly, as people in Alcoholics Anonymous know, until we do that fearless searching inventory of our own, our own faults, our own perpetrations, our own misdeeds, until we acknowledge it, until we face our own sins, our own falling short of the mark, we don't get free. So for the sake of others, and certainly for the sake of ourselves, a full facing, and then it can require a lot of inner resourcing, including with things like self-compassion and interacting with others who are supportive and caring to really face what we did and to go through even cycles that are deeper and deeper and deeper of feeling really crappy about what happened. And hopefully know that your capacity to feel true remorse honors you and is a sign of your own natural goodness. We cannot change the path. All we can do every day is step further and further uh, into living out the goodness that is within us. That's all we can do. So that's really the measure. So today, when you go to sleep, can you enjoy what the Buddha called the, the bliss of blamelessness? You were a good enough human today.
no blame, no fault, sleep well, and begin again tomorrow. Okay, let's see. Anybody want to talk with me um, individually? You have a question? You go to the reactions button with the smiley face at the bottom of your Zoom window and push that reactions button and you'll pop, pop to the front of the stack. Um, I'll, you know, uh, typically I'll kind of look for people maybe you haven't spoken with me before, but in general, I'll be kind of happy to talk with people again. I see you there, Ken, so that'll be good. Happy to talk with you. Yeah. So I'm just kind of scanning the chat briefly to see if anybody else pops up. Okay, good. All right, Ken, I'm going to ask you to unmute. And as I always say, Ken, I'll say it to everybody, uh, when you ask a question, try to be concise, make room for other people, and have it be related to what we've talked about here. Okay, take it away, Ken. First, thanks for your wonderful evening. Speak up, okay, or maybe come closer to your microphone. Is this better? Much better. Okay. Um, for, first of all, thanks for your... This is a great way to, to spend Wednesday evening. Oh, um, for me too. <laughs> it's a win-win. Uh, before I retired, I worked in healthcare and I did uh, uh, a stint on a brain injury uh, or a traumatic brain injury. And what I learned about the brain fascinated me and I've continued studying it ever since then. And just by coincidence, I really watched a documentary that talked about the human brain. Um, and I remember the fact that the infant brain up until two years old has the most neural connections that we will ever have in our life. Yeah. What happens during this critical period is called pruning, where uh, the, uh, the, uh, the neural pathways that are used grow strong, the ones that are not used atrophy. Um, so my question is, a child in a disordered environment, um, their pathways that are strengthened are negative. Um, and this is personal to me because I find myself 66 years later um, still struggling with trying to break free of those deeply, deeply, deeply embedded ways of thinking. Um, until I ran into your work, um, I thought it was a way of being that was uh, absolute and unchangeable. Yeah. Now I believe it's possible to change, but this is a Herculean task because these are not little... Uh, to quote a, a character defects, you know, I didn't, I didn't steal a Twinkie from the grocery store yesterday. Uh, yeah. this, from the earliest and deepest part of how my brain built itself based upon its environment. So that's my question is, uh, how do you, is it possible and how do you get to where you can break free of that orbit? Huge question. Where'd you go? <laughs> no, that's good. Um, so thank you for bringing it up. Big, big question. Central to clinical psychology, central to many, many different um, uh, approaches to suffering. It is certainly true that these early patterns uh, can become deeply ingrained. Um, the brain is designed to learn especially from negative experiences, particularly in relationships in very early childhood. So you caught the quad there, you know, all four of them. And that's just mother nature's plan to keep her critters alive um, without much care and concern for, you know, their, their quality of life along the way. And so um, what to do about it? Big, big, big question. Bottom line, there is hope. There really is hope. The deeper the grooves, uh, the more effort we need to make, not necessarily Herculean, but the more effort we need to make to do something about it. Uh, part of the approach depends on what you're really wanting to focus on maybe these days. Uh, and then that kind of shapes what you're doing. 
let's say in terms of our um, topic tonight, you're looking for ways to help yourself. I'll just kind of make it up. Help yourself be one step more vulnerable in appropriate situations. One step more vulnerable. And when you start to get a little wiggy about it, unnecessarily so based on that history, you hang in there and you don't move into, let's say, anger or frustration. You stay um, open-hearted. So you're trying to help yourself do that. Maybe that's it. So growth occurs usually one step at a time with occasional 10-step breakthroughs and then followed by one step at a time. So in that particular situation, you would do what for me has been top three, probably personal growth methods of all, which is what I call risk the dreaded experience in a very structured kind of way. In my book, Just One Thing, I talk about literally risk the dreaded experience. I think in other books, I'm resilient. I think I talk about it as well. The basic idea is to identify what the next step is of your, just, to, just one step outside your current comfort zone, your current habit pattern, whatever that one step is. Be aware of what is risky for you about it, what you're what you fear you might experience, but are actually unlikely to experience, and then make yourself risk the dreaded experience. Make yourself take that step. And when it goes well, and don't try to sabotage yourself, do what you can so that it does go well. When it does go well, man, oh man, oh man, really bring a big spoon, really eat, gobble up the learning that's available for you when it does go well. And then, ba-boom, one more step, push back the bars of your invisible cage. That process right there, kind of summarized, is, wow, is there, you know, it's fantastic. And um, it's authentic. Uh, you can do it in real life. You're in charge of the process. You observe directly that it's real. Uh, it's not airy-fairy. It's not pie in the sky. It's real. Uh, there's a kind of courage that's required. So just doing it is virtuous. Doing it in, is is a source of self-respect. Risk the dreaded experience in a step-by-step -step way, and then take in the benefit, take in the results when it goes well. So I, I would say that as a general proposition. And increasingly, what will happen is we really can unlearn um, these inhibitions. You know, we can we can dismantle the bars of the cage we acquired in terms of our armor and our habits of being. Second, and I'll finish on this one, we really can, and here's my intuition for you, that I, I really believe you could do this, you know, from previous interactions we've had, is to do what I refer to as linking, you know, in my heel framework, have, enrich, absorb, and link as the fundamental process of self-directed neuroplasticity positive neuroplasticity, uh, linking means associating positive to negative, okay? So it's a very common thing. It might sound fancy, but we all do it. It's, you know, it's, it's a normal thing to do. What you could think about from what you know from your history, and I say you, all of us, from what you, you, whoever you are, including me, I'm, I'm looking at you, Rick. <laughs> I'm talking to you, Rick. <laughs> And whatever you know your history, um, what was missing when you were little? What would have been so good? Not so much to have occur, although that's where it starts, but to have experienced. What would have been so healing or nurturing or reassuring or healthy to have experienced when you were five years old, five months old, five weeks, five days, five minutes old. What would have been so good? So you start to identify what I kind of call metaphorically as your vitamin C to address the miss what's missing inside that makes you feel like you have scurvy, metaphorically speaking. So very specifically, if you have some intuition from your history or from just sensing or awareness inside yourself, and often what we most push away is what we most needed when we were little because the longing for it is associated with pain. So if you kind of start to have an intuition or even, you know, close, 
to what was missing then, look for ways to experience it in some aspect today. Look for ways to have it as an experience today in a more adult form, maybe in a watered down form, maybe in a more partial form, not the whole pie, maybe missing some slices of what would have been so good when you were two years old, but it's still good. And then when that experience is available to you, authentically, it's either happening or you're deliberately kind of queuing it up. You're helping it happen by maybe taking action in some way or bringing awareness to something or thinking about something. When you get that song playing in the inner iPod, right? Connect it emotionally to the younger layers of yourself, even just in your own imagination. Even if you're kind of numb to those inner layers, they're there, they're there. And you can just kind of send um, the good nutrients, the good psychological nutrients their way. So you can work both sides of it, right? On the one hand, risk the dreaded experience to break out of old armor that served its purpose when you were two years old or 12 years old or 22 years old. Risk the dreaded experience. And second, bring in the food, the psychological food that was missing or would have been um, healing and good medicine for things that happened to you when you were little. Those two together, that's a year's worth of self-directed psychotherapy right there. You know, uh, a minute here, 10 minutes there each day. Bit by bit though, you can make an extraordinary difference in yourself. And there's a lot of evidence for people who've, about people who've had really, really messed up, seriously damaging childhoods. Bad, bad, bad stuff, you know, including landing on really vulnerable people who with effort and skill and frankly some grace, some luck probably too in the mix, are able to really, really find a healing. The, um, they still might, as, as I can be, they still might be a little vulnerable to getting re-triggered in certain kinds of perfect storm situations. Okay. They might know that they still are kind of uh, vulnerable to reacting in certain ways in certain situations, so they avoid those situations. Or they might know that, you know, actually, it really shores up. It supports my psychological well-being to, to spend time with friends. Or it doesn't help me to drink. Drinking is not good for me. Or it helps me, you know, I'm one of those people who really could use half an hour of vigorous exercise every day. Or I, I you know, my dog, my dog is, you know, my, my guru <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, whatever, it's okay, it's okay. You're, you could still have a functional full healing, even if, you know, you're a little careful about certain people or certain situations, or you know that it's really important to keep, you know, bringing in certain practices or certain communities of practice to kind of help you stay on the high road. That's okay. That's a realistic uh, result of what I'm describing here.